All right, Mo. Uh, so you're a veteran, so I'm gonna I'm gonna skip my intro and just have you introduce yourself and <laughs> kick things off. How about that? You know how to do this. All right, let's do it. Um, let me just share my. So let me introduce myself first, and I'll just share my screen right after. So uh, I am Mohammed Bahardin, uh, technical solutions architect with Cisco. Uh, I am going on my 16th year, I think, at Cisco. Now, I've been focused on the IoT side for the last seven to eight years now. Um, and we'll, we'll get into this as part of the conversation that we'll have today, but we'll talk about um, you know, Cisco and really IoT and what IoT means to Cisco. Um, thank you for joining us and I hope uh, folks that were not here can watch the recording. That said, let me share my screen and let's get started. All right, cool. So a quick agenda for um, kind of what we'll cover today. Um, I'll try to use it as uh, I tried to put this together with as little slides as possible, but I always end up adding slides. Uh, but I also have uh, uh, you know some demos in store for you guys as well. So what I'll kind of walk you through is hey, how does this? I, how is IoT is really defined at Cisco? Um, and when when we use the term IoT, there's usually um, this notion of OT versus IT. So we'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, then I'll go into um, you know, some use cases that we address with IoT. Um, and I'll focus on really three main use cases. Uh, actually one more use case, which is more on um, the IT side of IoT, if you will, and that I'll talk a little bit about and my expertise is not in that area, so I'll just give you a glimpse of what Cisco does, uh, but then we'll go a little bit deeper into these three topics. The first of which is uh, extending kind of networks with wireless um, and secure equipment access and OT kind of network security. And these use cases are really based on uh, the conversations the, you know, uh, that we have with uh, several of our customers uh, in supporting IoT. So when we get you know, brought into meetings and when we work with other customers to identify issues, and it's primarily around these use cases. So there, there's a couple of others that I didn't really include, but if I were to pick the top three, these are definitely the top three, uh, starting from the top um, and almost kind of in that, that order, if you will, right? And then uh, towards the end, I'll just give you a quick snapshot of our IoT portfolio, just literally just one slide. Uh, to, to give you a glimpse of really what the IoT portfolio is all about. Again, keep it interactive, ask questions, uh, interrupt me, uh, and um, we will kind of uh, walk through this as well. So when we talk about uh, how is IoT defined at Cisco, right, there's really two um, notions, right? One is what we've kind of classified as indoor IoT. And the other is industrial IoT. Um, and when I said I've been working at Cisco in IoT for the last 78 years, it's primarily been around industrial IoT. Uh, but the beginning of that uh, also was around uh, the indoor IoT stuff as well, which which uh, wasn't really called indoor IoT at that part at that point, uh, but it's morphed into kind of what indoor IoT is today. But what indoor IoT is really is um, how do we uh, make our enterprise smarter in terms of the spaces that are uh, that we have, right? Our office spaces, especially as more and more companies are returning to work and offices are opening up, um, there is a, a push to bring a, a hybrid work experience where the IT and the home office, uh, sorry, the, the enterprise, the, the, the buildings that people go into and what they've been used to for the last two to three years of working from home, right, uh, uh, are kind of married or, 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 or converged, right? And so the indoor IT use cases are really uh, around that. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Again, not my expertise there. So I'll just give you a glimpse of what I know. 
Um, but then what I'll focus a little bit more on, on the use cases are really on the industrial IoT. And this is, um, uh, you know, at Cisco, we've seen a, a tremendous amount of growth in industrial IoT. And when we're talking about industrial IoT, um, we've seen organizations, whether they're in manufacturers themselves or utilities or um, uh, logistics firms and companies, ports, uh, pushing and pushing the innovation envelope to be able to really digitize their their operations. And that uh, is what we've been really helping focus on customers with is helping them build um, or, or modernize their 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 uh, operational technology environments, which is mostly classified as industrial IoT uh, from a Cisco perspective, right? So those are really the really the two ways that IoT is categorized, if you will, at Cisco, or the two buckets that they fall into. Um, the top being more specific to the enterprise and enterprise IT, and then the bottom being uh, more on the OT side. But with that said, what we're also seeing even on the OT side is a convergence of these teams that are managing this infrastructure, this equipment, because people that are uh, in charge or responsible for uh, building things necessarily don't want to be responsible for managing the networks that those things, those robots, those machines connect to. So we've seen really a convergence of IT and OT teams trying to work together. So the next thing I'll really talk about is building, like what does IT and OT mean, right? And uh, what are these folks responsible for? What are their care about? Because their care abouts are, are usually very different. Um, when we look at IT, really their main function is to keep the corporate business applications and functions of those applications running smoothly and the users of those applications being able to access that information, uh, whether it's on their laptop at home or working from home, um, just as most of uh, we have been, right? But that's primarily been what they're being responsible for is all the employees that need to do their day-to-day -day functions are able to access their applications and technologies, whether they're in person or at home. So the software, the networks, the data centers, all of that that is involved is really the, the management aspect of what that IT team does. And what they care about is also a lot different than on the OT side, right? What they care about is first and foremost, securing the environment and ensure, you know, data security as well as information security and even user access and things like that. Um, whereas on the OT side, that might not be the case, right? And on the OT side, what primarily the OT users care about is uptime. So I have, you know, customers that have literally had malware infected lines running in production and they know that it's infected and they know they have issues with it, but they will choose to keep it running because all they really care about is uptime, right? For them, if that line or that machine is not building something or they're not building product, that is a loss to the, the revenue of the company. So malware infect, you know, whether it's infected with malware or not, is not their primary concern. Their primary concern is uptime and they will run their lines even if it is compromised, if you will, quote unquote, right? Um, uh, uh, to ensure that uptime. And then also uh, with most of these process industries, whether it's manufacturing, utilities, oil and gas, uh, ports, uh, logistics, warehousing. Uh, another big concern for them is safety, safety of the folks that are in these, in these, these uh, hazardous environments, right? So that is also a little bit different than if you would say from an IT perspective. And then when they look at managing, it's really figuring out what are the physical assets, the robots, that they have the PLCs, the programmable logic controllers, if you will, um, and other devices in that environment that they would prefer to manage, program, and operate versus the IT infrastructure, the networks that those devices connect to. 
right? And, and, and again, and what they're responsible for is really ensuring that manufacturing process runs smoothly. So where Cisco comes in, in a lot of these conversations, right, is how do we bring these two worlds together and make these worlds work better together, really? Um, because, you know, for, for, for probably the last decade or even longer than that, these worlds have really been siloed, segmented, uh, air gap, quote unquote, that because of things like COVID and because now I can't have a tech fly in from another state and operate or uh, fix the machine, they have to be able to do it remotely, uh, right? Like those those requirements, those needs, those changes those have, have changed. So the, uh, these OT users that said, hey, my environment is completely cut off from the internet now had to all of a sudden connect these things to the internet. And with that becomes a whole slew of other challenges that they're not ready to, to deal with, right? So when really, when we work with, you know, uh, most of our customers, what we're looking to do is help bridge this gap and help IT take on the functions that help them really uh, manage these environments for the OT users while the OT users can focus on building products. Um, any questions there, comments? And again, feel free to interrupt as we go through as well. So all joking aside, right? Like what we're really trying to do is bring these two worlds together, right? And help bridge that gap and, uh, and make sure that, that, that both, both work towards the, the benefit of the company and the stock, the shareholders of that company as well. Sorry, was there a question, Robert? Yeah, actually, um, yeah. so I'm glad you brought this up because uh, I, I, I'm not familiar with the term programmable logic controller. Yep. Um, is that something that's specific to the OT world? Uh, it's primarily used in the OT world, the programmable logic controller, right? Um, you know, a simplest way to maybe think of it is, you know, in, if, you, if, if at your house you have an air conditioner, you have essentially a thermostat that controls that air conditioning unit, right? So that is the controller for that device, if you will. Mm -hmm. Similar to that, now if you take that analogy and then you bring it into a manufacturing operation, right? So, um, you know, uh, for example, I work with a car manufacturer, right? They build cars and in that car, they have robots that have to be able to work together to do something, whether it's weld a piece on a door or insert, you know, uh, an object somewhere, those things have to be, there's a, a logic that follows, right? Like do this first, then do this, then do this. Yeah. So yeah. what controls that function is a programmable logic controller. And whether that's in manufacturing, whether that's in oil and gas, whether that's a building management system that is... Uh, Mo? I think we just lost Mo. He still shows connected, but I sure don't hear anything. Uh, Mo, if you can hear us. Do you have his cell number? Can you try to text him maybe? Um, uh, let me see here. Ping him online here if he's still on. Okay, I'm going to pause this. Yep. Um, okay. Right. Yeah, you know, my, uh, my, uh, my desk pro just <laughs> died on me. So let me do this. Go back. Uh, I think I need to sh Okay, yeah, I think you need to swap your screens. Did that work? No, it didn't work. No. 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 Hold on. 
Is your uh, desk press still rebooting or? Yeah, it's just trying to reconnect. So I'm okay. Just All right. Disconnect from that completely. Okay. Just go to this. Let me share. Uh, you should see this. Perfect. Yep. There we go. All right. Cool. Right. Yep. So uh, I'm not sure where I cut off, but what I was gonna go to go into more of uh, is talk briefly about the industry or indoor IoT at Cisco, and then go into the industrial IoT. So indoor IoT at Cisco really, um, you know, is indoor IoT, and I say you know also known as kind of smart building. So when as as organizations are kind of looking to, hey Mo, sorry, it went back to the. Uh... That's weird. Yeah. Here. Um, do you want to just take it out of presentation mode and just? Yeah, I can do that. Uh, Sorry. But I can just share my uh, second screen. Let me do that. Okay. That usually works better. Uh, display. Oh, there we go. Yeah, perfect. There we go. Thanks. All right. So, with yeah. indoor IoT or smart buildings, really, uh, what what most organizations, especially now um, with the returning to work, figure out the, the the safety of the work environment that folks are coming back into, um, figure out you know how, how how much these you, these spaces are being used, uh, when they're being used, so that they can better make usage of that that indoor space. Um, especially because a lot of corporations have kind of downsized their real estate footprint in the last two years. So how do they make better uh, utilization of the spaces that they do have and make that more interactive and enable a better, you know, uh, in office experience is primarily the goal of these, as well as um, ensure things like energy savings and uh, environmental and asset monitoring type of use cases as well. Right, and for them to be able to do that, whether it's asset management or room finding or employee safety, um, any of these types of use cases essentially um, is 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 dependent upon having a collection of sensors. Whether those sensors um, uh, are connected via Wi-Fi, predominantly through Wi-Fi or BLE technologies, is what we see indoors. Um, and, and those technologies that are then used to be able to address these types of use cases, right? Then, as I said in the beginning of this call, this is not my expertise or my uh, uh, where I uh, focus deeply on. So, you know, I'll just kind of leave that. But this is the the uh, types of use cases that are really uh, um, uh, in this area, what I'll focus a little bit more really is on the industrial IoT part at Cisco. And when I'm talking about the industrial IoT part, it's really everything that the outside of the enterprises, because, you know, whatever industry you may be in, there is more to your environment than just the enterprise. So how do we extend that enterprise environment to uh, you know, a parking lot, right? Or a warehouse. Um, how do we look at things like airports and seaports? And um, if I have uh, uh, fleets, whether it's a service vehicle or whether it's a delivery vehicle for that matter, right? Uh, or any type of utilities. Um, how do we kind of, you know, uh, uh, connect those environments in those areas and help extend those policies that are that are deployed in the enterprise into these non carpeted spaces and still be able to enforce the policies that the enterprise IT teams have developed and designed uh, and implemented inside of the carpeted spaces as well. And when we look at the actual use cases, I mean, there's these use cases are abundant. Um, whether it's, you know, smart city type use cases of figuring, you know, uh, out getting real time traffic updates to pedestrian safety issues, um, whether it's, you know, a, a, a warehouse, I'm sure all of us probably, you know, subscribers to Amazon Prime. Well, how does a warehouse figure out where all its devices are? How do those robots move around the warehouse? How do the control systems that, 
you know, uh, put goods in a box so that they can be shipped out the same day that you order it, for example. Um, how do auto manufacturers push cars through their production line? Uh, how do utilities uh, connect to the grid uh, or uh, allow you to connect to the grid? If you have solar panels on your roof um, and you're feeding that, that, that back into the grid, how do they um, do things like distributed energy resource management um, and ensure that they either compensate you for that or, or whatnot? So a lot of those use cases also uh, are the things that you know, we primarily work on from an industrial IoT perspective. But from all of that, what I'm going to really focus next is these top three use cases that I mentioned. Right? Is first, how do we extend these wireless net or these networks with wireless technologies? Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about secure equipment access, and then uh, we'll go into like OT network security as well. So. Um, the first part is really around extending the networks, extending the enterprise networks with wireless. Um, so when we look at um, connectivity, whether now as corpor corporations uh, uh, are opening their doors up, but they want to make it comfortable for their employees, they want to make spaces open, maybe outdoor spaces open for their employees to be able to work from, um, how do they extend that connectivity outdoors? Uh, how do they get connectivity in a parking lot, for example, um, so that they know, you know, when people arrive or they leave? Or from a safety and security perspective, how do they get cameras connected um, and provide, you know, um, uh, surveillance of environments, whether it's for uh, safety and security purposes or for purely analytics purposes? You know, how many people are coming in and out of my facility, my restaurant, my uh, office building, whatever that may be, and using that camera for analytics, but how do I get uh, uh, that, that, that camera essentially connected if it is out, outside of my, the four walls of my office building, right? Um, so there's several outdoor connectivity requirements that we see from customers. And when they look at something as simple as a parking lot, right? Um, you know, if, if they have, there's significant challenges with sometimes extending wired technologies ex outside of that um, uh, enterprise building. You know, for example, it costs $27,000 per mile to just lay fiber, and that's not including all the timing it takes to be able to uh, pull permits and things of that nature, right? So if a company, for example, has a parking lot that is across a roadway, right? And now they need to be able to extend that fiber across that roadway because they want connectivity, security cameras, whatever they want. It's not just the cost of laying the fiber, but they have to pull permits and all that. It takes time for them to be able to do that, right? And, and time uh, equals money. So what can companies do to be able to extend this wireless technology or, or this, this, this wired technology to the, to these outdoor spaces and get the same performance level out of these is really by extending and expanding that. And to enable customers to be able to do that, um, Cisco actually acquired a company about two years ago now, a company was called Fluid Mesh, and that product and technology has been um, rebranded Relabeled inside of Cisco called um, uh, Al Cisco Ultra Reliable Wireless Backhaul. I know it's a mouthful, so we call it Curb for short. Uh, but what this technology allows us to do is to get really good distance, so up to 15 miles of distance at 500 megabits of throughput. Right. Um, it's also a mobile technology, meaning that it can be used for uh vehicles as well right and and we can go from um access point to access point if you will with zero millisecond uh of, of, of handoff up to 225 miles an hour so this is really developed for trains right um so if a, 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 a you know um a train is going down track how does it maintain connectivity it's the same technology that we use to be able to do that um and so 15 miles 
is 500 megabits per second. We can go 30 miles at about 150 megabits per second. We get really, really good range, uh, provided that this, you know, there is line of sight. Um, to do something at 15 miles or 30 miles it does require a clear line of sight uh, from the two radios, but we are able to do that. Right? And this allows us to be able to extend the enterprise level type of services and give you good bandwidth in locations that you may, you know, not know or uh, not, uh, not, um, had you not had the capacity to be able to expand that fiber footprint too, or that wired footprint too. So for use cases such as safety and security, uh, outdoor Wi-Fi access points that need coverage, for example, um, this technology really allows us to be able to quickly deploy that. Um, it also can be used for temporary deployments, right? So whether it's, there may be an event that your company's throwing and they need to get connectivity outdoors and they want to be able to do that quickly. You know, it literally in, 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 in less than an hour, you can get this uh, technology stood up um, and connected and uh, 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 have access to uh, either cameras or wireless access points that can then be back all over this traffic uh, in really in, 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 in no time and in, in being able to do that. So those are the two main, you know, uh, or one main use case we see, we see this across industries. So whether it's retail, whether it's, uh, you know, hospitals and, and, and uh, um, uh, or whether it's power utilities or water utilities or manufacturing, um, you know, for example, we're working with some car manufacturers that, as you know, because of the chip shortage, they're, they're kind of building cars almost you know complete but not but they're putting them out in parking lots now they want to be able to monitor the condition of those cars as they're sitting in those parking lots right how do you get something out there quickly well this technology allows them to be able to do that really quickly uh, with very minimal investment on their part to be able to do that so let me do a quick demo and just kind of i'll come back to this and and, and go there but before i do that any questions well, yeah, I have a question. Sorry. Um, of course. So, you, you know, like when, when COVID hit, right? Like, uh, you know, everything was locked down and, and a lot of hospitals were building out in their parking lots. Like, is that a, also um, a good use case for something like that? That That's a great use case, to be honest. Yeah. So yeah. any pop-ups, quick pop-ups, like I need something, you know, this is a, this doesn't really show us this, but whether it's a, COVID test side or a hospital, you know, outdoor hospital triage area for the ER because their indoor ER is, is overwhelmed and they uh -huh. need to be able to quickly get connectivity in there. You throw two of these radios on each side to get that connectivity. And then from that connectivity, you can put a wireless access point um, and, and, and provide coverage, wireless coverage, or even wired coverage for that matter inside of those 10, those 10 facilities. So, mm -hmm. Uh, not really to hospitals, but for example, events, um, there are 2 events that we did recently. Uh, 1 was a, a golf event, I believe in Pebble beach that we were using this technology to provide uh, wireless connectivity for uh, the golfing event. Um, and then we also. Uh, did a, um, indie, so autonomous indie challenge. So I'm not sure if you guys know, but just like the, uh, you know, um, Indie F1. Uh, race, there was an autonomous F1 race that was uh, end of last year, I believe, or maybe earlier this year, um, where these cars were going around a track uh, at 120, 130 miles an hour, uh, autonomously being driven, right? Um, and that was connected live, getting telemetry from those vehicles as they were going at, a, you know, upwards of 100 miles an hour on a track as well. So several different use cases for this. Um, the, the key thing here is, is the ability to push a lot of bandwidth at very low latencies, um, and very easy for you to get this up and running, um, uh, uh, as well. Thanks, man. Yeah, of course. So let me pop into my demo and just kind of show you something. Uh, let's see. 
So this is easier to do it this way anyways. So with uh, this is just a quick demo of the uh, product, the Curve product. Again, it was called Fluid Mesh before, so that's the, the notion you, you see of FM or Fluid Mesh. Um, but it's, it's comprised of a few different things. So this demo just shows you a Meraki camera that's connected to that end device. Um, there's a couple of different products that go. So Racer is really a configuration tool to be able to, you know, if you have two radios, if you have 200 radios, uh, we can use Racer to be able to quickly create a configuration and deploy that configuration uh, to those users, uh, to that end device. And if those radios are connected to the internet, then they can automatically uh, download that configuration just based on uh, the model and its serial number, for example, right? So this is primarily a configuration template tool that allows them customers to or be able to create a template and provide you know general settings of that environment. And once those settings are complete, they can either be downloaded and then pushed directly to the device. And that's how we get the device up and running quickly, or it can be uh, connected to the cloud, uh, internet and through the cloud, pull down those connections uh, instantaneously. And this is how literally in a matter of minutes, if the templates are already created, you can get a radio up and running in, in really a matter of minutes. And that's really what the, the racer product is. The next part is the device configuration view as well. So just like we have, so once a, a template is defined, if you wanted to log into the radio itself and, and either, you know, modify that configuration or validate that configuration, then you can log into the radio itself and, and, and validate that. And because this is a demo system, it just gives me the ability to a, a read only view of what that is, but, you know, nothing, you know, basic network configurations is really what you're going to see. And then if you do have multiple radios, then we have a monitoring tool that allows you to monitor all these multiple radios. Um, you can um, look at things like latency, uptime, the number of devices that are connected to that. Um, and then you can, you know, um, look at the topology view of these as well. Uh, look at the two, the health of those two radios. Uh, oops, yeah. Now you can see that radio here. You can then go directly to it if you want. You can uh, look at the actual link itself, right? So you can see, let's see if I can move this up a little bit. Uh, maybe not. But you can see, you know, the throughput that's going through that device um, or that link, if you will, the latency, the signals, you know, RSSI information between that um, so that you can really figure out um, how these devices are performing in that environment, uh, as well as things like challenge utilization. And in this use case, what we do is we have a, a Meraki camera that's connected to the end, that end device. So if, you, if I click on the camera, this is somewhere in RTP right now. So you're probably gonna see just blinds and mirrors, but let's see. So we see that one camera. So, and as you can see, this is getting a live stream from that, uh, and and because the the blinds are closed, we can't really see outdoors. But I'll go back. But before I do, let me just kind of show you that. And you see, like you know, we went up a little bit in bandwidth because we're pulling that that stream live. Um, if I did more with this, right? If I let's see, let's go down here and um, we do like a motion search and see. They okay, tell me what changed here. Uh, and then pull our timeline back. Uh, let's go to this morning. As you can see here, you know, you can kind of shift through that. And then uh, when we do that, Right, you should see now more bandwidth being consumed as I'm pulling more data from that camera, right? Um, so, let's see, my motion search is finally coming in. Um, and as I'm kind of clicking through this, you'll see if I flip back to this, uh, oops, right, you'll see more bandwidth being pushed through that device, for example. 
and this is just a simple point to point link. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of give you a sense of, you know, what the tools are and um, the look and the feel of that environment and what that this product can do. Right. So any questions there? Okay, I got one more for you. Oh. Yeah, of course. You know, back in the day, right? Like we used to sell these wireless bridges, and that was just eight hundred two eleven, whatever, right? Like what, um, what, like what, what is it that's being transferred here that makes it so reliable? Like I don't, I don't, you don't need to get too deep. But I'm just curious, like what's the big difference? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, let me come back. And here. are these bridges? Are they like routed endpoints or? Yeah. Um, so they can be configured as bridges. So uh -huh. it's essentially like you're extending um, a, a, a layer two network, right? Um, so just like in the old days of having two access points and creating a link between them, they're essentially doing the same thing. But what, what is different is um, it's using a proprietary protocol between the two. So what the protocol does, it's essentially a implementation of MPLS over wireless. And what that allows us to do is to, you know, not be subjective to the, the inherent nature of how 802.11 Wi-Fi works, right? And by leveraging, again, the same spectrum, so we're still using the 5.9 gigahertz spectrum, by leveraging that spectrum, we can essentially still not have to pay for, you know, we, we still use the unlicensed spectrum, but by having essentially a, a radio, so essentially you'll have a one access point and another access point here. Whoops. That's what I get for trying to draw <laughs> on the, <laughs> give me a, right? You have two access points and you're essentially just creating, you know, if that is connected to a switch on this side and a switch on the other side, it's just extending that, that, that layer two segment, right? So it is just as if I have a cable that's connected from that one switch to the other, um, except that it's not, it's, it's over this wireless technology, right? Um, and, and that's why it's not a replacement for Wi-Fi. So if I needed a, a, a Wi-Fi access, I would still, you know, need a, 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 a Wi-Fi access point, for example, to be able to have clients that connect to mm. that access point, right, directly. We're essentially, what we're doing is we're replacing the wired medium with a wireless medium. So, you know, the, the the slogan that we have right now is, you know, no fiber, no problem is because literally we're giving you a fiber like connectivity over that wireless infrastructure. Does that answer the question, Robert? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm going to follow that up. Right. Like, you know, um, when we used to sell those 8211 wireless bridges, right? Like on a windy day, or if there was, you know, like something blocking it, it would cause a spanning tree to kick in, right? Um, what, 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 I mean, what is the mechanism that makes it more reliable here? Is it, is it just more buffered or, you know, I mean, the, dumb question, the, but I'm the, curious. The protocol, the, itself? You know, the, the fluid mesh protocol is what, what it comes down to to increase the reliability, right? Because with with Wi-Fi technology, uh, you are essentially relegated almost to the weakest link, right? So if you have oh. a uh, and and you're using a radio that uh, you, even if it has two radios on it, right? And um, and you're trying to do backhaul over it, you essentially cut your throughput in half if that's doing client access and that's doing a backhaul technology, right? Whereas this, we're focused primarily on the black call te backhaul technology only. And in the backhaul technology, we're using the fluid mesh protocol that is continuously monitoring, right? That link health and ensuring that link health is maintained, right? But because it is on the 5.9 gigahertz spectrum, if somebody comes out there with a, you know, a, a blaster and wipes out, uh, you know, uh, you're still you're still kind of susceptible to that 
So before you deploy something like this, you would still do something like a site survey to figure out the best channel that you need to uh, configure these radios to, and then use that channel to be able to do that. But provided you have this line of sight between these two radios, right? We can, you know, without, you know, any issues get that level of throughput at that level of distance. Thanks, man. Yeah. So the next thing that I'll kind of go into is um, secure equipment access. So um, this has been an ask from a lot of our customers. It's, I mean, this is like blown up because of COVID um, because primarily we've had customers that have been used to having people or contractors, um, you know, come on site to be able to do things. But because of COVID, because of travel restrictions, because of, you know, offices being closed down, even, you know, um, corporate policies that other companies may have that's different from their companies, right? They just don't have the ability to get somebody in person to be able to do that. And from an IT perspective, you know, you're like, well, that's why we have VPN, right? But now if you have non-corporate users that need VPN access, well, how do you provide that securely and, and quickly? And traditionally, what we've done is that is essentially we've had, you know, a, a firewall that has uh, that has that 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 has been connected, and that firewall was that really that entry point or that exit point to be able to provide that. And now, if you need to bring in third parties, contractors, vendors that required a whole onboarding process to be able to bring them into your environment. Right as a you know onboarded user, and then leveraging the tools and technology that you have inside of, of your enterprise to be able to do that, right? And and that might have been something that would take an organization two weeks or sometimes two months to be able to do that. And when we talk about this in a manufacturing environment, where I, for example, I'm an auto manufacturer, my my welding robot is broken, and I need a uh, uh, a vendor to come and service it, but because of travel restrictions, they can't get a flight in, or because their company doesn't allow them to travel anymore, they can't do it, or whatever it may be. Like that, two weeks is too long. Two months is definitely too long, right? So, because of this, and you know, this is one example. This can be to a building management system. This can be. Uh, to a security camera, this can be to, you know, any really endpoint that a customer needs connectivity to. Um, what we've essentially developed is a technology called secure equipment access, which essentially is the easy button to be able to do that. Um, right? So what this requires is essentially a, 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 a gateway um, that then gets connectivity, right? So um, this end device, whatever that end device may be, is connected to a gateway. That gateway can be over cellular networks or can be through an enterprise network, right? And that gateway is connected to our IoT operations dashboard. And that is where we essentially allow, deny users and services through. And then we have that remote access user, which now can really connect to these devices from anywhere in the world to any allowed device that they are able to do, right? And we can get this up and running in, in literally under an hour from shipping you a new box to setting this up. And uh, probably in about 30 minutes, we could probably get you up and running, right? So what's required? Let me just quickly stop sharing and, uh, oh yeah, you can't can see my video. So, you know, right on my desk, I have one of these gateways, so pretty small box itself, right? This connects directly up into that operations dashboard I showed you. Um, it has an Ethernet port and a cellular SIM card, uh, two Ethernet ports, one for LAN, essentially one for WAN, and both, both of which can be LAN. So you can connect this to a switch and then get more ports if you needed to, but if you can connect this directly to an end device and have that access to that device as well. Right? So I'll show you what that looks like in a second, but pretty easy to get going, literally, Probably in under 30 minutes, we can get you set up. 
box automatically connects up into the, the operations dashboard, gets done its configuration, and, and then can allow for the allowed access. Right? And because, again, this, these are a louder uh, a lot service. It really depends on what the, the, the use cases are. There are only you know, a certain number of supported protocols, if you will. Whoops, uh, that's not what I wanted to share. Give me a second. Stop sharing, share, screen. Cool. So this allows them to really get somebody you know connected and you can when the once that they're done you can literally go in and turn their access off as, as well right so that now there's no uh, you know security violation or potential security violation that can occur so for us to be able to do this um let me you know kind of show you we log in through a portal um and there's several routers that we support in here, the, the two of which I showed you on my desk, and I have another one that you can't really see from some on my equipment, uh, my bookshelf that has my other equipment on there. Um, but let me just quickly show you what that router looks like. So you come into this dashboard, and I have this router. Show me. Maybe it's not up, but let's see. Let's see. So essentially, you have a router here. I don't, this doesn't look like it's up on this side, but let me show you somebody else's router. Um, basic, you know, um, monitoring information about the device itself, cell usage, and things like that. You know the devices that may be connected to it, the interfaces. So this is just from a, a router management perspective. But what's more interesting, really, um, is the uh, secure equipment access part. And here is where we look at the actual devices. Um, the device uh, we add that gateway into this portal right here. I've added that, and I, I know that you know this is up on uh, online and, and talking to my environment. Um, then the devices that sit between that are added here. So, for example, I've added the router itself, or I'd, I've added that, you know, a, a laptop so I can show you what that access looks like. Um, and let me. And then this is, you know, really who gets access to what devices. Right, and um, you know, over here again, I have router access and 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 uh, you know RDP access. So as I mentioned earlier, um, let's see, when we look at the actual access technologies itself, I'm trying to show you. Um, it's not everything. So there are only a couple of you know pro protocols that are supported. Let me see if I can. Uh, no, no, that's not it. Whoops. So access methods, here we go. So the access methods essentially SSH, RDP, VNC, or HTTPS, right? So these are the, the, the access methods that are supported. Um, and if those access methods satisfy, then you know, we add that access method, we map it to a user or a group of users that can use that device. Um, and then we allow them to be able to access that. So here I have that router spec. So once I click on it, um, I can see that. Let's see if uh, I can see what the username and password is. So I see that and I can log in. It's the same password. Yeah. 
So I can do all this essentially uh, through this, this web portal that you're seeing here, right? Uh, that's one option. The other is uh, like RDP. So I'll just show you an example of that as that's coming in. So you'll see, and hopefully that laptop is up. This laptop is a little bit slow, so it's, it might take a second, but um, so this is essentially a way for me to get um, an RDP session, again, literally in a matter of minutes, right? So, um, and we can get something up and running. And so as you can see, it's not smoke and mirrors. I'm really connected to this device um, and we're able to do that. And again, this is done literally in a matter of minutes. So it's really easy for us to set up and get going. So this is the easy button and, and we're seeing a lot of interest in this, whether it's connecting you to a vending machine, a, 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 a uh, you know, a uh, engineering workstation inside of a plant floor, um, you know, multiple different use cases that, that customers are coming to us, a, a charging station, for example. Right, um, I may have a, a charger that I want to connect to an EV charger and get data or be able to troubleshoot and figure out why my billing data is not coming through. So we've got a lot of different use cases that are coming uh, for these, these remote access uh, technologies. And as, as you saw, that's pretty easy, um, you know, from a user experience perspective, literally 2 clicks and you're able to access your device versus having to VPN in and uh, all that um, setting up policies and all that, like. Right, you you're kind of foregoing all that for the easy button. But that said, you're you're kind of you know um, only able to do those those access methods that I showed you. So VNC, RDP, SSH, uh, and any type of web app that you may have running in the background as well. Right. Let me uh, pause. Any questions there? So, if there's no questions, I'll move to the um, OT network security. So, um, I'm sure you guys have seen several incidences of uh, um, OT networks being compromised. Yeah. Either, you know, most recently. Sorry, was there a question? No, I'm sorry. I was chuckling because, yeah, I mean, read any headline these days, someone's getting compromised somewhere, right? <laughs> Yep, exactly. And especially now, as we've seen more uh, air gap, quote unquote, air gap networks being connected, right? Um, it's just unleashing uh, the these companies because a lot of these OT networks really security has been an afterthought. Uh, a lot of these uh, OT networks are flat layer two networks with zero segmentation, a zero kind of policy control. Um, so, a lot of organizations, you know, the conversations we have is, well, how do we move, you know, we have NAC inside of our enterprise, but how do I do that on a plant floor, right? I'm trying to move to this zero trust world, if you will, and, or, or I, I'm on that journey inside of my enterprise, but how do I do that in a industrial setting or a OT network environment? And that's what I'll talk about next, right? Um, and for us to be able to extend that zero trust boundary or do things like, you know, NAC in an industrial setting um, is a little bit different than in the enterprise space, primarily because of the endpoints are different, right? Uh, um, in, in, in the enterprise space, you have your tablets, your iPhones, your Android devices, uh, your laptops, right? Uh, these are primarily the endpoints that are connecting uh, and, and for that, there are um, in, enough of um, solutions out there that provide visibility into what that endpoint is. Um, there are enough um, policy control engines, right? Like things, products like ICE, for example, that have device profiles of your laptop, of your, you know, iPhone, of your Android tablet, and your, you know, Mac OS laptop, for example, and they can use those device profiles to be able to create policies that when an, uh, a device associates the network. 
that's not the case when it comes to OT networks, right? Um, how does a programmable logic controller get profiled? How does a robot, a KUKA robot, or a, um, uh, a, a, a remote terminal unit, or a you know IED, or all these different industrial devices, how do they get profiled so that we create policies around? And for us to be able to do that, we need to be able to understand what devices are on those industrial networks, right? What protocols do they communicate over? Who's talking to whom? And be able to figure out what that is so that we know, hey, these are the devices that we have. These devices match or are remediated against any type of, uh, you know, uh, vulnerabilities that may be exist. Right, and then use that information to create network segmentation policies inside of industrial uh, environments, and ultimately be able to detect and respond to threats so that we can mitigate uh, uh, these these incidents that we are all seeing um, on the news daily. So the first part of that is really around industrial visibility. So um, what do we do? What do I mean by that is is being able to look at these industrial traffic patterns and these devices and extract meaningful information from those devices, right? So things like who's that vendor? What is the model of that PLC, for example, that's connected, right? What's the, the serial number? What is the, the protocol that it's, that it's running? All that information, that metadata, is required for me to be able to use to create a policy around. And that's really what we're, we're, we're doing here is we have essentially a tool called CyberVision, which is uh, essentially a two tier system. It uses a sensor that runs on the actual, um, you know, a network device itself. And it uses a uh, it, it essentially runs on the switch itself or the router or the gateway. It's able to span that traffic from those switch ports, VLANs, whatever it's, uh, is connected to that end device, do some deep packet inspection of that traffic, and then understand what that traffic is, what that device is that's connected to. So what devices you have, who's talking to whom, what are they saying, all that information, and then send it up to a center which is able to aggregate that information and then display what that information looks like. So what does that mean? What, what, what do I get? What's the output of that is really what you're seeing on the, the right side here is the, you know, visibility about the actual asset itself, right? Asset identity information that, you know, in addition to just the Mac address and IP address device details about those particular, that particular device, what that device is connected to. So when I'm creating policy and when I'm creating these groups, I can, you know, be confident in creating a policy that matches with the behavior of that device or what that device behavior is. And then also, you know, deep level OT information about what variables are being accessed, what that controller is talking about, and then flows of information, right? What, what device or what activity is being seen um, between these this, this information. And then what I can use that is then use that information to be able to create these segmentation policies, right? What do I mean by that? And I can identify relationships between devices, right? And say, hey, this device talks to these particular devices. I can then use that information to create, you know, endpoint or zones, for example, right? Whether that's a building, right? or whether that is a, a line or a building management system or a manufacturing line within a facility, for example, I can use you know, that information to create these logical boundaries that we can then use to be able to create these segmentation policies, all right, that can then be pushed into uh, your manufacturing environment. So just like you do this today for your IT devices, like a laptop, right? And you say, hey, a laptop that's connected in my building in, in, in Orange County, 
should be able to talk to other devices in Orange County, but maybe it shouldn't be able to talk to devices that are sitting in Austin, Texas. Well, we can do that same type of, you know, control inside of a manufacturing environment now, right? So devices that are building products in my first cell should not be allowed to access products that are in my second cell. Well, I can create a policy map inside of my same tools that I use for my enterprise, like DNA Center and ICE, to be able to create that policy uh, to say, yes, allow that, but don't allow cell one to cell two communication for eight thousand, right? And we can go from this notion of understanding what devices exist in the environment, right? By running that sensor, by getting visibility, so if I have devices that are connected down here to my, you know, my access switches, for example, I can figure out what those devices are, understand those relationships, send that data up in through CyberVision to ICE or DNA Center or a combination of the two, create that policy, and then have that policy instantiate, come, come you know, come back down and, and, and instantiate segmentation policies to those devices so that you can implement security policies down here, right? So this is how we go full circle and do what we're already doing on the enterprise space, but now inside of my OT space or my manufacturing or industrial control system environments as well. I know I said a lot there, so let me kind of pause. Any questions, clarifications? Hey Mo, this is Jason. I had a quick yeah. question. So <clears throat> when the DNA centers pushing down the policy, can you apply that to any of those, any line of IE switches, or is it just a subset of yeah. the IE switches? Because there's a lot of different IE switches out there. Yep, yeah, yeah, great question. So uh, the level of segmentation will be dependent on the, the, the type of IE switch, right? So we have switches that support TrustSec and the switches that don't support TrustSec and just do MACSEC, right? So we have, uh, you know, if, if macro segmentation and VLAN segmentation is good enough, then we have more switches that support MACSEC and allow you to do the VLAN segmentation. But if you're looking to do micro segmentation, right, and not allow two devices in the same VLAN to talk to each other, then we have a smaller subset of switches that support um, TrustSec and allow you to be able to do that segmentation as well. Got it. Thank you. Yep, no problem, but good question. So if there's no other questions, I'll do a quick kind of demo of what, you know, CyberVision is all about and the type of visibility that we can see there. Uh, and then we will wrap up. So, oh, you know what, Mo, can I ask one more question about yeah, CyberVision? Yeah. Um, and you may have covered this. I had to step away for a second, so I apologize if you already covered this. But when it comes to the sensor devices, how much of the processing of data is done on the sensor versus how much of the processing of the data or the insights is done on the CyberVision service itself? Yeah, great question. So um, all of the processing is done on the sen sensor, as you see okay. here. So when we, uh, and that's, that's a great question. So the sensor itself um, sees all of the data the only thing that is pushed up into the center is the metadata. So, you know, 100% of the traffic is seen by that sensor. And essentially what we're doing is we're doing a span to a sensor that's located inside of a switch, right? Mm -hmm. So if the switch doesn't support it, we do have a, a hardware-based sensor as well that you can have. Um, but that then requires you to build an out of band span network to be able to get the same level of visibility that we can do inside of the same switch that you know is doing the switching already right so if we can use the same switch and the same switch supports that sensor then the preference is to be able to do that because because it eliminates the need to build an out of band span network but now once the sensor sees 100% of that traffic uh only about 1 to 3% of that traffic that the sensor sees is sent up into the center. And that is just the metadata that allows us to give you all of this information about what it sees there. 
Got it. So, for example, if I want a temperature sensor, I just need to ensure that there's a temperature sensor option that I can add into my whatever IE three thousand or something like that. Well, not exactly. Not, not so, quite. okay, not quite, because these sensors are really looking at the industrial traffic that is going across mm -hmm. this, right? And 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 it's maybe it's the building management set the, the the building management system that the temperature sensor is connected to and we're going to see that traffic but it's mm. not predominantly it's not just a temperature sensor got it okay thank you very much that clarifies that for me a lot yeah no problem any other questions so let me I'll do a quick demo on uh, CyberVision. Um, all right. So um, when you log into CyberVision, essentially what you're greeted with is is a. Uh, oops. Let me log back in here. Okay. Um, you're essentially given an idea of um, the the um, a view into the operational view. Again, this is more towards the that OT user, if you will, and then a security view, which can be either from an IT perspective or an OT perspective. Um, the operational view just gives you an idea of the protocols that are being used in the environment, uh, the most critical events that are seen, um, as well as some presets that I'll go into in a second. And the security overview tells you about, hey, what are all the devices that we see? What are the devices that have vulnerabilities associated to it? And then we also provide a risk score, so based on the vulnerability that is there, as well as the place in the network, uh, uh, the, the, the potential impact of that vulnerability being exposed, uh, we assign it a risk score, and then we're able to tell you what that risk score is and how to mitigate or lower that risk score uh, as well. Um, so this is like a 30 day, the last 30 day view to look more into cyber vision. Then we click into explore. Uh, then you've presented a set of presets. These you know, presets are user defined uh, or system defined things like IP communications, control systems, information, network management data, uh, all this data. But for the purpose of the demo, I'll just show you everything that we see here. And then when you click there, you'll see essentially, hey, there's no data. Well, that's because this is looking at essentially a real time view. Um, if I, and, and this is a, uh, a static demo environment. So if I make this, you know, the last year of data, then you'll see uh, the, the devices that are exist. Number, the, the, the devices is what devices that we see, the activities are the relationships between those, the vulnerabilities are all the vulnerabilities that exist in those devices. Right, and the events that are associated to that. Variables are really OT specific uh, uh, variable information. And then down here, we see um, a, a breakdown into all the different tags that are associated, whether it's control system behavior or you know, things like ping traffic, right? Uh, or broadcast traffic. Uh, and then all the protocols that we see. And, and here is where those sensors, right? are going to be exchanging that information, whether that is over, uh, you know, VNet IP, which is through a manufacturer called Yokogawa, or whether it is uh, through things like S7, which is a Siemens protocol, or, you know, Profinet, which is also a Siemens protocol, or Ethernet IP, which is a Rockwell protocol, right? All these different protocols is the visibility that we're able to provide you and then this information is what we can then use to be able to create those policies and such inside of DNA Center and ICE that I showed you earlier. But when we look at these, this information that we see here, this gives you a, a, a view of what that information looks like. And then this is more of a map view of that, right? So what are the, um, the devices and their relationships with other devices? And then you see those devices as well as the relationships between those devices. Um, you can see, you know, these groupings and these groupings are things that you can, you are user defined, right? So I can essentially, you know, create things like a substation, you know, and this is a, a utility example, 
that shows a, a, a control center, an enterprise network, and a, and a, a, a substation for that utility network, for example, uh, different devices that are in that environment, right? Um, or a, a, a oil and gas example. So these are, again, control specific, and that's what CyberVision really focuses on is industrial control system traffic. Um, so let me pick something and see. So for example, I picked this, uh, you know, um, Siemens controller. Um, and when you look at the controller, you're presented um, this additional detailed information, right? And this information is then which can be passed into ICE Right, so that you can now create a device profile of what that 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 industrial control uh, uh, device looks like, uh, and use that information to create a profile. In addition to that, you can also send the group information. So, for example, this is part of this folding production line, right? And I've associated a group called folding line production line, and that can also be used to. Um, that could also be used to then create uh, those groups inside of ICE so that you can allow and, or deny traffic between as well, right? So let me, you know, in the additional information that we can see, uh, essentially like vulnerabilities that exist, right? So what are those vulnerabilities that exist? Um, and why was it identified as vulnerabilities because of this model number, for example? Um, where are the sources of that vulnerability that we you know got that from both from Siemens and some I ICS cert, which is a government organization that provides that information, right? And a CBSS score associated to that. We also provide you things like credentials. So if you have admin password or def default credentials that are being used in those devices, you can see what that looks like. Um, activity is really like a mini map of that device and what devices that it's associated to or talking to. And then also the flows of that information, right? So the, the, the source destination, as well as the, the protocol information that we see. Um, automation information. So this is very control specific. So these controllers exchange things called variables, which either you read from or you write to, and you can then see what that information looks like. And then here's that risk score that I said. Uh, again, you know, this is a pretty low risk score. But um, based on the, you know, the, the, um, the, the, the types of vulnerabilities that we see, as well as the impact of those vulnerabilities being compromised is, is that associated risk score. And that's something that we can show you and kind of help you gauge, right? And then what the best achievable risk score is if we address these vulnerabilities, well, we can further reduce that risk score down uh, to that to that for that device, right? And then what's that what that information looks like. So this is detailed information about the actual device itself. Um, and then uh, you know we can also create things like baselines. So I can create a baseline of information um, right and say hey this is what a normal operating environment looks like. Um, and then what I can do is I can report against those baselines. So for the purpose of the demo, we already have a baseline created and some traffic generated to show you what that looks like. And then you can see, you know, new components, for example, that have been detected that are not a part of my baseline, as well as new activities um, that you can then, you know, further drill down and dig into. Um, and then you can acknowledge that, or you can report that, which then generates a syslog message that can be uh, or, or an email that can then you can take action on uh, as well. And because CyberVision is a passive tool, it's not going to you know block anything. Or again, we do these in very uh, OT specific environments like manufacturing environments or uh, you know power grids and utility environments. So um, again, blocking something without really investigating is a big no no. <laughs> so we essentially report on what that is, and then the end user can take whatever action to be able to mitigate that, that, that environment or that, 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 uh, um, discrepancy that we see. 
So we see these, we can acknowledge these, right? Um, and then um, you can see that kind of that goes away from this list and you can go through all these as well. And uh, then we also have an event view. So this event view gives you a view into all the, uh, you know, events that we see in this in environment, whether it's security events or control system events and such. So for example, if I looked at, you know, control system events, this gives you essentially a play by play of when things occurred, right? So you had an outage at 3 a.m. last, you know, yesterday morning or 2 a.m. last morning, right? You can go back and see, well, what, what occurred and what are the sequence of those events as they occurred? Um, and again, because this is a demo system, I think everything will show the same timestamp or close to the same timestamp. But um, you see here, you'll see a sequence of those events as they occurred. Uh, and when they occur so that you can really drill down and see when those things happened, right? Um, and investigate and really figure out, was it because of a network issue or because somebody pushed the wrong code to the PLC, for example, the logic controller. So this is how you can kind of go back and drill down in time. And then from an administration perspective, this is where we can also, you know, manage all the sensors in the network whether it's one sensor or a hundred sensors, um, we can deploy the sensors here. Um, we can also, you know, capture information uh, from a sensor. So if you wanted to get a quick PCAP of traffic, you can start recording, um, you know, wait for a couple of seconds or minutes or however long you want um, uh, to be able to do that. And then stop recording. Um, and then you can download a PCAP for example, and, and analyze that in the bar chart or whatnot. You can also use existing PCAPs and then upload that information into a PCAP here, and then you can um, process that in the in the product so that you can look at that data as well. In addition to the, the uh, visibility information, it also matches against, you know, IDS signatures. Um, these can be community-driven signatures that you see here, or you can subscribe, it's a premium subscription through Talos that you can connect to and get live signature feeds through um, uh, a Cisco, Cisco Talos as well, right? So you can get IDS for industrial control system information. And then this also integrates into things like ICE um, natively or other security products like Firepower Management Center or Firepower Threat Defense. So for a use case where you want a firewall to be able to block a misbehaving device or a traffic pattern that you don't recognize, well, CyberVision won't do the blocking the firewall can, but by configuring this integration, you can do that. And also can, can, is also integrated with SecureX so that you can get full visibility into your IT and OT view of what a potential vulnerability or a, a threat vector can be in your environment as well. Right, so that's a quick glimpse into CyberVision and what that's all about. Um, we can definitely follow up and do a, a deeper dive if that's required, but that's, you know, I just wanted to show you what that what looks like as well. Any questions there? So the last thing on my agenda is just a quick snapshot. Again, I promise one slide and I'll keep it to one slide of what the Cisco IoT portfolio is all about. And, and this is it. Um, if you look, you know, when Cisco, especially when we talk about industrial IoT, what we mean is devices that sit outside of the enterprise space. So all of these devices that you see here um, have no moving parts, no fans inside of them, for example, right? and they are passively cooled through the chassis of the device. They would stand, you know, uh, minus 40 degrees Celsius to positive or plus 75 degrees Celsius. That's like 160 degrees Fahrenheit, I think, right? So uh, extremely temperate, uh, 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 varying degrees of temperature, humidity, um, you know, our uh, majority of these devices are IP30 rated and um, can work in dusty conditions. Uh, some of these devices are IP67 rated, right? That means that they can be, you know, um, washed down or hosed down. We have a, a meat processor, for example, that we work with, 
um, you know, at the end of the day, once they're done, they, they hose down uh, that environment, right, uh, for sanitation purposes. And they can put a switch in there that can be hosed down. We have other use cases where um, uh, a router needs to be mounted on, on a pole. Um, and that pole needs to be able to be rained on uh, or snowed on or whatnot. And we can, you know, provide a, a, a router that can be pole mounted, for example, or industrial Wi-Fi if I needed to get an access point and, and have that access point mounted outdoors and not be susceptible to the, element, the elements of the weather, uh, we, can, we can provide an access point and, and do that. So a lot of that, you know, technology that you're already used to with Cisco are also provided in this industrial form factor that allows you to extend the enterprise management tools that you have today uh, and manage that same technology, this same, uh, use that same technology to manage these same switches, gateways, routers uh, as well, in addition to the security products that we talked about uh, as well. And then fluid mesh, which, which we went into that I won't really belabor. But this is what the overall portfolio is. Um, you know, if there is a specific follow up from the user uh, group and you want to talk about anything else on here, I'm more than happy to come back and talk to you guys about it. Um, or feel free to essentially reach out to me and uh, get, you know, further information from me as well. Um, here's my email address. Um, if you wanted to get in contact with me and, and, and get more information from me, but that is. Pretty much what I had for today. Um, any questions, comments um, before we end for the day? I don't have anything. That was great. But Mo, it was nice to see the demos uh, to tie some of those components together. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, thanks, Mo. Thanks for taking the time to prepare and present tonight. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. And uh, if there's anything that, uh, you know, as follow-ups that come out of this or anybody wants to know more, just feel free to reach out. I'm more than happy uh, to get connected and provide any details needed. Thanks, Mo. All right, I'm going to stop the recording.